name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so excited to introduce this virtual event with Stephanie D. Preston, presenting her book, The Altruistic Urge, Why We're Driven to Help Others, in conversation with Dr. Gary Lavis. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. This evening's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Next Thursday, June 30th, we'll host celebrated archaeologist Rebecca Rag Sykes for a presentation of her latest book, Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death, and Art, in conversation with Harvard's Julie Lawrence. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our science research public lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our author at any time during the talk tonight, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase the altruistic urge on harvard.com your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Stephanie D. Preston is a professor of psychology at the University of Michigan, where she leads the Ecological Neuroscience Laboratory. Her current research, some of which appears in tonight's book, examines how emotions impact important human decisions, particularly to consume material goods and natural resources and help other people in the environment. Tonight, she is joined in conversation by Dr. Garrett Lavis, writer, neuroscientist, and currently visiting fellow at Harvard Law School's Animal Law and Policy Program. As a researcher and as a professor, Garrett and his teams have investigated everything from how chemical pollutants in the environment to contribute to disease and to the, emo and to the emotional and empathic capacity of laboratory mice. This evening, Stephanie and Garrett have joined us for discussion of the altruistic urge, a powerful and searching culmination of decades of research into the physical origins of selflessness, which Carolyn Zahn Waxer calls an innovative breakthrough body of work. Written in an engaging style, the work is marked both by scientific rigor and creativity. Preston's compassion for all beings shines through. Merging extensive interdisciplinary research that spans psychology, neuroscience, neurobiology, and environmental biology, the altruistic urge develops a groundbreaking model of altruism, its motivations, and its manifestations. I will end with final praise from Franz de Waal, who writes, Stephanie Preston knows human and animal empathy as no other. By demonstrating that helping behavior is baked into the mammalian brain, her eye-opening and well-written book takes the puzzle out of the puzzle of altruism. We've got a lot to learn this evening, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Stephanie and Garrett. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and me too. <laughs> so, um, Stephanie, are you going to talk a little bit about your work, or should I um, go right in and give you some, ask you some questions about this marvelous book that you've written? Oh, sure. You can start with questions. We can go, I guess, from like more general to more specific to ground people in the general yeah, idea. Yeah. So, I got to just say, I'm totally delighted to be talking with you today. I, um, for people who are listening, I'm. Um, I came into neuroscience a little bit later, and um, I first learned of, of Dr. Pestrin's work through this seminal article she wrote on understanding empathy in animals. It was written in 2002, so we're talking actually 20 years ago with, with Franz de Waal, who's another phenomenally uh, important scientist in, in, in animal research and in empathy in specific. When I talk about a seminal article, this is 72 pages long. Most, most articles that scientists read are about 10 pages, maybe a little bit more. And whereas most of us get maybe 20 citations, that means that other scientists write their works and cite the authors that inspired them. This 
particular paper, uh, which inspired me dramatic in, in many, many ways, uh, has been cited over 5,000 times. So from my point of view, I'm talking to one of the uh, most important people in my field. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's really exciting to talk with you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So I, so you wrote this terrific book, The Altru Altruistic Urge, Why We're Help um, why we're driven to help others. And it offers this fascinating insight into how and why. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Can you show it again? <laughs> right there. Get this book. It, it offers this great insight into how we, how and why we as humans can be powerfully driven to help one another. And that this urge to help each other out is a trait that's built into who we are as animals. That's how I see it. So, but that's maybe not the right way to put it. So my first question is, in your words, what, what is the thesis of your book? Yeah, I think that's um, appropriate, everything you said. I think for me, it's this idea that the mammalian need to care for offspring, like your own babies um, across species, especially in animals that provide longer term care for their offspring, like humans, non-human primates, even rodents and mammals are more caregiving in some species than, you know, let's say an alligator <laughs> or like a fish. But um, so this instinct, you have to protect the offspring. So there's these really simple, powerful neural circuits in your brain that there are many, many empirical studies of, especially in rodent animal models of caregiving behavior that demonstrate sort of like a switch that can flip from avoiding a neonate or a strange other animal to really feeling powerfully motivated to reach out to them and grab them back from danger um, in a way that I think we share with, um, other species. So there's kinds of altruisms that aren't exactly like this, right? Where, you know, you might do a good deed so that your name is in the program at the symphony, or you want your name on the hospital building or something like that. Or sometimes people give strategically, like they want a specific organization to thrive for reasons that are personal to them. Um, but at this core level, there's a kind of altruism we don't know very much about, which is like heroic altruism. Yeah. So when somebody like reaches out to grab somebody back from danger in a very literal way, or, you know, like the classic heroes who grab people out of burning buildings and rushing waters and, you know, subway um, platforms, those are cases where there's a literal leap into a very dangerous situation to drag somebody back who is often a stranger, usually a stranger in the heroic cases, um, which kind of confounds scientists. Like there's not very many articles on why people do this. It doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't fit with a lot of theories we have about altruism. So I was looking into this caregiving um, uh, model in neuroscience and in uh, rodent models. And Michael Newman in particular has many articles on this um, phenomenon and the brain circuitry involved and how it shifts over the course of like being pregnant and giving birth to really activate this urge to help the vulnerable. And so it sounded to me really analogous to the way we reach out to grab you know, our kid falling off the slide or, you know, somebody about to go out into traffic from the crosswalk or even these more heroic cases where it's not like the kinds of altruism we normally study in the lab. It's like a very quick decision right. that doesn't have a whole lot of cogitation and rational reasoning involved, which people assume is how humans are altruistic. They assume because we have these big brains that allows us to be pro-social which it does in some cases, but we also have a form of this core style of altruism that is really motivating and it acts almost at like a below conscious level, um, but it's a very smart mechanism that prevents people from getting into too much trouble or, you know, you wouldn't jump into a track of a subway 
if you didn't think you could carry the person out or you wouldn't jump into the waters to save somebody if you couldn't swim, you know, like, so the mechanism already has this like approach versus avoidance phenomenon going on where your brain is titrating the response automatically without you having to make like a pros and cons list to yeah. determine, you know, whether you're likely to be successful and what the right response is. I love that. I mean, it, it, it what I, uh, what I like about this, this in its entirety is that you're kind of going, you're going at the altruism question in a, in a different way from how I think you and I both were trained. Like we usually think about the evolution of altruism, right? So we're like, well, you know, altruism, and it's always been hard. It's been hard since Darwin to say, well, how, why would an animal help out anybody else for any other reason? Because ultimately it's all about competing for as, getting as much as you can from, from others. And you're like, um, you're saying, well, that's one way to look at it, but we can look at it without this kind of heavy handed evolution oriented um, competition based approach. And we see kind of, we can look at the kind of the psychology of it, the, the, the impulses that are happening inside, um, maybe the emotional impulses that are happening at a very quick level um, and I think that that opens up such a vast amount of, of insight to not only animals, but well, human animals, I mean, not only animals, but non-human animals, but, but human animals that, that we are, we are driven in part by psychological impulses that may, may or may not be that tightly linked um, or directly linked to some kind of competitive advantage. I think that's exciting. Yeah, and I think it's important to clarify, which I didn't do earlier, but I do very, um, I do in the book. And this might be related to David's question in the Q&A section, but it, it's a common question, which is why I address all of these concerns in the book is, you know, well, how do you square this with the idea that people are very competitive and even cruel, you know? There are so many instances all around us, all around the world of people being incredibly cruel to another individual or being apathetic to the needs of other people, you know, um, all around us and around the world. And so how can we square some altruistic urge with this idea that we're kind of blind to or even seeking suffering in so many cases in human life and in animals? also. And I think it's based on this very intelligent neural design, right? And so you might have your own competing goals for any given situation, right? Like they talk about the bystander apathy. If you see a person injured on the sidewalk in a public space, you might stop if you don't feel like you're in danger and you're not in a hurry to get to a job interview, right? But if you're in a hurry to get to a job interview, the amount of attention you're gonna allocate to these other people in need is gonna like narrow oh, right. significantly. Right. And so, um, and then you can have competing needs at an even more profound level. So for example, you know, with this, genocide in other countries, there's this sense in which we need to wipe out this outgroup in order to outcompete them, to have access to all of the resources and to have control over the situation. So there's this sense in which the personal goals of the individuals is overriding their ability to kind of see an outgroup as human in the way that we would for our in-group. And there's actually a lot of really interesting studies of that in the brain of people's empathic pain responses in the insula and the anterior oh, right. circulate are significantly reduced if you see the pain of somebody who's not from your social or ethnic racial group um, in, in a sort of alarming way. So people's sort of capacity for this in-group, out-group, what they call parochial altruism and your own competing needs for your own personal life and your fear that you'll get in trouble or not do it right or not be able to succeed. These are all kind of like baked into the calculus that your brain makes when it decides on a motor response. Like your motor system is highly predictive and integrative and it doesn't actually need a whole lot of contemplation 
unless you're making a really significant investment and you need to like, you know, there's plenty of time to decide what you're right. going to invest. When there's no time, your brain can calculate quickly and pretty accurately whether this is a good idea or not and to the degree that it helps versus hurts you. Well, there's so much interesting work showing now, um, uh, like Jonathan Haidt's work that shows that we're probably overestimating the amount that our cortex, our ability to think and rationalize um, are really at play in a lot of what we do and that maybe it might be serving to some extent um, just our basic emotional core that works at a much faster rate. And it's, 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 uh, it's in many ways, it's, it's much, it's been on, on the evolutionary plate for a lot longer. It's ironic to me that when we think about animals, we think about them as, you know, the, the old way, the way we got kind of into this business was through Descartes is seeing them as kind of automatons is like robots that didn't have emotions. And it, it's kind of flipping, like we're actually seeing that they, these, and you, like this altruistic urge, these abilities to com compute very rapidly a situation and come up with a response is driven, maybe driven by these, by these uh, highly uh, developed emotional systems, in, at least in mammals, right? So um, yeah, that's and also I think fascinating. Yeah, and I think it's really important to consider that, for example, most of this kind of philosophical comparative neuroscience is about why are humans special? Like what makes us so great, <laughs> you know? And the focus is typically on like this extended and, um, you know, cortex, neocortex with a lot of um, fissures and gyri, you know, that you don't always yeah. see in other species. And so I'm flipping it on its head. I'm saying, okay, yes, we do have some of those things, right? Like monkeys aren't building bridges and they're not, you know, investing yeah, in yeah. Bitcoin and taking rocket ships out of the atmosphere. They're, they're not doing that. But there's a lot of things that we kind of cherish in our own human nature that we do overlap with other species like this capacity yeah. for compassion, for helping another, for collaboration, um, you know, th things that people elevate for empathy for others th that elevate in their minds as like a human capacity, but is shared in other animals. And so it's not that like, we're so great. It's like animals are actually great too. And like your brain, the way it evolved per se is great. So like your brain evolved over time, but it kept most of the core functions intact you know, in similar brain areas that evolved from the same area in the, you know, prior speciation split. So we, we didn't reinvent the brain when we became human. We have like all the same brain areas as rats do. That's why, you know, we test our drugs on them because they're going to have similar impacts on a rat as they have on us, um, which wouldn't make sense if our brains were so different, right? But I think the way we're educated and experience other animals, it's kind of foreign to people that animals have these capacities and that they're actually very similar just because size matters is the, you know, rubric <laughs> everybody's using. Right. right. Which is, well, yeah. And it, you, I mean, I, I, I play with this a lot in some of the work I'm doing, but I wonder if it's easy not to, it's better, was it? <laughs> Uh, it's it's hard to understand something if your income depends on not understanding it, that perhaps we diminish these capacities of for empathy and this altruistic urge in animals in part because it's a it's a challenging ethical question for us. It's a I mean that we need to maybe reconsider how we interact with them if they're not just things like toaster ovens you know they're they're right, right. they've got you know they care for each other they're willing to you know sometimes go out on a limb and maybe you know save save another another individual from harm and like that just opens up like these questions you know i just there was a recent court case with happy the elephant i don't know if you're aware of that oh, i'm not familiar with that well, apparently they were, there, there was a question about whether he, this happy the elephant in a zoo in New York City had uh, 
was um, could have personhood. And it ultimately was shot down, but there were some dissenting judges that said um, that maybe Happy the Elephant should have personhood and should have certain rights. Because right now it's kind of, it seems like it's mostly either you're a person or you're a thing. But I think it's, yeah. it's just, I guess I'm just kind of freely associated here, but it does it's seem like- when like in Europe, for example, and in England, I know they have like more stringent rules and definitions of the sentience of other beings. I know, um, you know, they're a little bit ahead of us in that regard. And I agree with you. There's this like motivated reasoning in which if we pay too much attention to the sentience of other species, we might not want to see where the sausage is made, <laughs> you know, like right. we right. might be more concerned about, you know, let's say cosmetic testing on animals and things of that nature. Right. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, those are examples that are used to say people are not empathic because let's say they eat meat or because they, you know, wear makeup tested on animals or something like that. But actually there's like a really strong undercurrent of empathy, even in those examples, because if you really didn't care about animals, period, you wouldn't care if you had to watch a documentary about the chicken farm or the, you know, oh. meat production facility. Like people find those things so distasteful and uncomfortable and they like want to avoid it. Like who wants to watch that horrible, you know, documentary? Like, I don't want to know anything about where my meat comes from. And in America, it's like separated even more because people only eat meat that's been like highly processed to not look like an animal, you know, like a chicken breast or a steak. Yeah. You know, we don't eat fish with the head on like they do in China and we don't eat, you know, these other parts that clearly say this is an animal. And I think it's right. part of that motivated reasoning where people are like, I don't want to know because I want to eat this and you can't have it both ways. So the best thing is to kind of like divert your attention away from those things, which is actually a sign that you are empathic, you know, That's terrific. yeah. There's even like weirder examples. I think it's unfortunate, um, but the Simon Baron Cohen had a book about evil. Um, was it called Beyond Good and Evil? No, that's a different one. Anyway, he had a book about empathy and evil um, behavior in societies and it had descriptions of genocide. But what I thought was interesting is these descriptions of genocide all involve dehumanizing acts. So those are horrible and they make the, the behavior sound even worse. But if you didn't have empathy for another human, you wouldn't need to dehumanize them first. You could just kill them wantonly, you know, and with no regard That's for true. how it was done, right? But right. if you debase them first so that they don't seem to you on the same level of humanity, it becomes easier to do an act that's actually very hard to do in your normal state of affairs, given if you were raised in a, you know, enriched environment with, you know, emotional, social support and those types of things that are needed to ratchet up this system into high gear. That's a really important, that's a great point. I, I mean, I, I've thought about that even in science that, you know, I, when I would, would do experiments, I'd be looking at like, you know, 20 animals and you know, they just had numbers. And if there was one that was really unique or different, or, you know, that would be an outlier and I'd remove it, right? It wouldn't be like, and and I guess that process of, of uh, maybe it's when we're dealing with lots and lots of people, it's easy, or individuals, it's just really easy for us to dehumanize them. And then of course, if we just look at their parts, like, you know, a chicken breast, um, we're we do it again. And then, you know, and then if you put on top of it, this idea, that there's not a chance that they have an altruistic urge. Like, why would an animal have that? That's something you get from, you know, going to Boy Scouts or something like that. Um, right. You know, you 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 so debase the reality. You so strip it of its kind of subjective sense. What I think also is important for us as humans to have um, that uh, just to be fully human is we strip all these things of everything else. We lose some aspect of ourselves somehow i, I don't really i don't oh, get into something i think that's really kind of interesting here, like, yeah that's really interesting because one of the things uh, we study that benjamin in, uh, mentioned in the intro is people's 
empathy and altruism toward the environment itself, right? And so there's this view in that field of environmental psychology that you're more likely to want to conserve the environment if you feel embedded in a biological system, like a complex system of interdependent animals and plants and air and water. And so people who have that construct of the environment are more likely to consider it to be important to preserve one part of the chain, because if one goes down, you know, we all suffer, right? But in America, we, we don't, we're not really taught that way about the environment and we feel very separated and segregated from it. And, you know, people will say things like, oh no, I don't like that activity. There's bugs, <laughs> you know, or like, I, I can't go there. They don't have air conditioning, you know, like people want to be segregated from the, the environment. And I thought one time there was this time life video series about animal behavior. But all of the all of the examples were of like, you know, sharks eating orcas or <laughs> right. you know, tigers chasing down impala, you know, <laughs> they were all like really violent predatory yes. behaviors. And then they said in the in the voiceover, they said, find out why we call them animals. <laughs> so like just <laughs> our concept of the word animal doesn't include us. We're not animals. I know, right. Right. Which is weird, too. I mean, we get this sense of like it's humans and animals. And then as if we're not that like it's so biologically not true. It's just some kind of carryover. Um, and then the thing is, it's like when we talk about animals, it's like they're not. I mean, I, I'm sure the altruistic urge may not be as strong in a wasp, may not have it at all. But we put them in the same category with rodents, you know, and and. There's that. So animals gets this massive collection of species and then humans is just one. I mean, it's just, there's so much, I mean, it gets to some questions that are, I think, pretty deep. Like, I mean, Michel Foucault gets into some of this stuff with just how much language affects how we think about things. Oh, and it goes yeah. back to your core statement, I think, that um, if we get away from this duality between animals and humans is we see more of a continuum and in that continuum, why wouldn't that altruistic urge go much deeper back to our, you know, our furry ancestors, you know? Right, our, and I think know. it's important, like we're both kind of neuroscience, animal behavior trained, or, you know, do, have done research in that area. And I think, um, wait, I lost my train of thought for one second there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think it's important to point out that this is not a Pollyanna view. OK, so like if you call it the altruistic urge, you know, it's like a, it's like exciting and appropriate and, um, you know, catchy. But it invites this criticism that like we're not altruistic. We don't have an urge to be altruistic. Right. And um, I think it's important to point out it's not thinking about other animals and the empathy that exists in a line across species because of the way our brains evolved is an empirical matter. It's a matter of like scientific fact that True. rats right. have a nucleus accumbens and they have opiates and dopamine and oxytocin right. and they take care of their young and not even just females who gave birth take care of their young. Even males will take care of pups as long as they're not scared of them or, right. you know, like they're, they're like upregulated hormonally or through experience with fostering pups. Like it, it's, it's in the data. It's not something that we're making up in order to say you should preserve the environment or, you know, you shouldn't eat beef or something like that. Like, that turns people off because they say like, I don't want you indoctrinating me into some point of view. And all I'm saying is this is data and it's in the science. And hmm. when you look at the brain, I think it convinces people a little more that this is real than yeah. a philosophical argument alone would have the ability to carry that weight, you know? That's, that's a great point. I feel like it, it's a challenge that I have all the time. Like, it seems like when the science gets to some space where it could have some kind of a moral or ethical uh, 
input or effect that people sometimes say, well, I mean, I don't believe in the science rather than I got to deal with the, uh, maybe I should start dealing yeah. with the moral issues, but, but the science itself isn't telling you, you know, what to do. That's not what science does. It's just telling you what's going on. And I, I, I worry sometimes like that, for instance, the work you're doing, some people in the science community could probably pay more attention to it, but they don't because it has some, it has some of the um, ethical um, aspects to it, it or it, ramifications to it that people don't want to address. But to do good science, we need to be thinking about the questions you're asking. Right. You know? And sometimes even the word empathy can have for people a soft connotation, you know, like that's not real hard science because that has to do with feelings, right? But feelings are science. <laughs> empathy is science. Like it's a phenomenon observed in the yeah. world in many species can be in the lab. It can be in the wild. It can be, right. you know, right. in there's even, you know, altruism in bees and wasps, right? We all know about the yeah. you know, like haplodiploid genetic structure where you're helping the queen with the worker bees. So um, these are observable scientific facts. It's not soft just because it refers to feelings, which I think has been a major change in science in the past, you know, 20 to 40 years. Like people like Paul Ekman studying yeah, emotion yeah. and Ralph Adolph showing where in the brain these different emotions are existing and Josh Green showing that, you know, there's these brain partitions for emotion based and utilitarian decisions, you know, these, these right, things right. kind of are helping solidify this as real, um, which I think is a good thing. Right. Yeah, it is. And it, 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 it it's just I think it is a good thing. There's a I, think I wanted to refer back to something you said earlier about um, groups of people or individuals. Uh, we talk about that in the book. There's really interesting research by people on the single victim effect, where people are much more likely to donate or give to a charity or volunteer to help if they only see like a single individual victim, like a person, yeah, um, yeah. not a group of people. Because the group is amorphous and it's like an abstract concept. But like this person in another country who is clearly suffering can pull your heartstrings and like activate this urge more strongly because we evolved in the context of observing like individuals, not aggregates right. or not abstractions in other nations that we're not familiar with. So it's very powerful in that way. And so you know, I think before we have q and A, I I think it's good to say, well, what is this knowledge gaining us? Like, how do we benefit from thinking about an altruistic urge? If it just sounds like a random event that only happens once in a while and it makes the news, <laughs> you know, how, how is it beneficial to us to think about this? Because there's already a lot of research on caregiving per se. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it helps because if you understand these neural systems, and what sets them off and what inhibits them, you can promote giving in cases where people want to give, it's aligned with their values, but the situation is not unlocking any motivation, right? Like if you're busy at work all day on your computer and you have to take care of your kids and make dinner and, you know, get, you know, enough sleep, you, you don't have time. You don't feel like you have the bandwidth to be thinking about other people or the environment, right? Or other yeah. animal species, things that your life is intersecting with, but not in ways you're able to appreciate because you have this sort of like narrowed attention on your needs. So if we understand this, you can think about things that are infant-like cues, things that are you know individuals and not groups, things that yeah. you are bonded with or identify with are gonna set off this instinct more. and you have to feel competent and capable of responding and have a sense of what the response should be, right? So they talk about that in like Bandura, um, you know, almost 80 years ago or something where people have to have this sense of competency in order to engage their motivation. And so you can't just say to people, 
guys, the world is on fire. <laughs> we have to stop driving, you know, because you can be like, well, I believe you that the world is on fire. And I believe you that it would be a good idea to stop driving. But what the heck am I going to do about that? You know, like, right. I don't right. have any control over like the oil companies, and I have to get to work, you know, like, how do you want me to get to work? Yeah. There's not a bus service from here to there, you know, like, so people need really concrete actions that they can take to ameliorate the suffering of a person or the environment exactly. or, you know. You know, it's funny, it, it brings brings my thinking to another question that we've talked about a little bit in, you know, prior to this, but it's this idea that, you know, narrative or writing or ta a story um, and I want to get into that for a second, but that a story is more effective than just numbers. And and I feel like it's not that it's a story, that stories are just some, it's that it's it's what you're getting at. It's the details of a person. Like it's 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 um what struck what's often struck me when I was doing mouse experiments is that not all the mice were the same. They actually were different. And you'd see, if you saw one really oddball mouse. You would it would really pull you in a direction like why are you doing that the others aren't and then you start and I feel like just as in in writing and narrative um, as you get into the details of what a person or you what or if you're writing about yourself if you get into those details of things um, more of that um, I don't know empathy toward yourself towards the organisms you're with emerges because you're giving it the space to see the details and touch it and smell it, hear it, uh, you know, that it's, yeah. it's, it's in that totality kind of. I think that's so important and it's very appropriate to the idea of a bookshop, right? Like a bookshop is selling books that are chock full of stories about oftentimes individuals' lives in a particular context that you can't experience, but you should be able to understand at some point sort of profound level or that you might take comfort from knowing that others have an experience that you've had. So, you know, in empathy research, they call it perspective taking. And there's even like a part of your brain right here that is more active when people are perspective taking, where you kind of go into the shoes of the lives of another person and their lived experience. And this is something that, you know, probably requires more cortical involvement. Um, but then you can benefit from that, right? Like you can create all of these sensory memories and associations as if you had that experience. It's not quite as impactful, but if the writing is good, it's pretty you know, impressive and it impresses upon you what this person's experience was deeply like and their lived experience right. is something you should learn from. And so we're trying to start a new organization that utilizes fiction for people writing science and for people telling first person stories of their accounts of their life, specifically for, you know, being able to teach other people about what other people's lives are like. And I think people are interested in this. That's why they read novels. You know, the empathy IRI questionnaire has a specific subscale for getting involved in the fantasy lives of others in books, you know, and whatnot. But, um, and people love podcasts because they tell these little snippets of stories that are really interesting. The Moth, you know, Radio Hour, you know, This American Life, like they, right. they're proliferating and we're learning from them. So let's see if we can solve some of these problems about, you know, climate change impacting people in Northeast China or, you know, code switching and university students being like a real burden for like their psychology or the trauma of somebody who has been to war. You know, like these are stories we, we actually don't want everyone to have to experience. But in order to support those individuals in their or, you know, these resources in their journey, it helps if we can a, a little bit get a, an understanding of it. And that's also an emotional infused, you know, neural process that right. we share with other species, except for the part where you're projecting into the future in your mind. Right, right, that's fascinating. I think you're right about that. It, the, 
it's it's so strange because it, it just that narrative is it seems like it's almost the flip side of the coin from the scientific process in that mm -hmm. it's it's not about sample size it's a sample of one is just fine <laughs> but yeah. so it's a, it's a different way of knowing really right and and maybe yeah. i mean i'm just throwing this out there but you know i think people i don't know how much i think scientists would like to think that we we're the ones that provide the information that's important, but I wonder how much, and I don't know if that's whether, whether most people think that or not, but I'm realizing as I get older that science is just, it's a way of knowing, but it's certainly not the only one. Like just, yeah. and I think that's what you're getting at. Um, and I think I, people's minds, even in science need to be open to this possibility. For example, you talked about, well, what is this unusual rat doing, you know, in psychology and in neuroscience, the rule is average everyone's data together and you have something or you don't have something, right? And right. human research, we have the opportunity, I study humans now, we have the opportunity to ask people, well, what was it like for you? Like, how did you experience this thing we showed you in the scanner or in the study or on the street? And when people never ask, you know, like yeah. they don't wanna know. <laughs> and you can get a lot further if you, Consider the qualitative experience of people in the moment um, on, on multiple levels and not just consider like you're all an aggregate, you know, like there's some scientific findings we never would have discovered if we weren't noticing what was different about these individuals. We, we talked about in the book, there was a one case we did a study of hospital patients and we wanted to see if people felt so this physiological empathy for hospital patients in need. They have um, chronic and terminal illness. And we have videos of their life stories and people um, watch the videos and they try and empathize with them. And I just went in with the assumption that these are all going to be terrible, sad stories, you know, but they weren't. There were some people who told sad stories. There were some people who were laughing and telling jokes. There were some people who didn't really want to talk at all. And we made like a typology of the quality of these patients and they impact people really differently. People are drawn towards these happy individuals and they feel empathy for the sad people, but then they're a little bit in conflict about how they want to help them because it's distressing to be around distress because of empathy. Right. I love that point. Do we want to do q and A? I don't know, Benjamin. Do you? Um, yeah, pivot to Q and A. Yeah, happy, happy to happy to pivot to Q and A now. Um, so we just have a few questions thus far. So everyone, feel free to submit some more. I want to start with this one um, from David Bogosian. Um, so I'm going to sort of pull a question from this, but. I think a lot of us are here today um, and a lot of us are interested in the ways that we've often sort of been told that ultimately we're sort of self-interested. And I'm yeah. sort of interested in if you can sort of shed light on why it is that we've been told that <laughs> or, or what sort of what really led us to this moment in which we've been told by science as well as you know other sort of communities that we are self-interested creatures you know it's, and you know what has sort of led us to this uh you know, culmination culminating belief can I, right go ahead um, Gary. i just i want to say when i was in graduate school i was so i started work with uh in behavioral ecology way back at university of michigan and and some guy came up to me and told me you oh, know blue. what's that <laughs> Go yeah, blue. go blue, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so we're I, we're learning about how much competition is critical for evolution, and and I I learned that at the same time, and this is in the middle of the Cold War, that in Russia, the same kinds of students as me were learning that co cooperation was the key thing in evolution, and you know, there's arguments to be made for that. Seventeen percent of the uh, of the eusocial social insects, they're like 3% of the insects and 17% of the biomass of the insects, they're doing well, right? Because they help and they're helping each other out. So there's an argument to be made for that. So, and I'll leave this to Stephanie, but my sense is some of the ways in which we look at other animals are serve interests that aren't necessarily related to the animals themselves, but might be related to what we wanna think of ourselves as a society. 
So if we start thinking of animals as cooperative or or su supporting, you know, then the narrative of us being hard nosed, competitive, you know, tough guys kind of has to take a back seat. And I'll just throw that out yeah. there. What do you think, Steph? No, I think that's an awesome point. It has like multiple levels and it addresses a lot of what David was talking about where ecology is very important to me in the book, to you. So like in ecology, each animal is in a context where different behaviors are gonna serve survival in that specific context, right? Just like at a meta level, Americans are in a context of like capitalism and the Cold War um, individuals are in a context of, you know, communism. So there's your context is helping you survive. And so casting cultural phenomena that's amorphous as one way or the other can like feed into, you know, perpetuating that context or making you successful in that context. But I also think there's this sense in which your brain per se is a categorizing machine. So the first opening chapter of the book is about categorization actually. And I think phenomena in the world are a lot more continuous than people's categories of them are like bounded boxes, right? And there's like research and linguistics and things about that. And so people have a really hard time. It's like the yin and the yang. And they say that Westerners aren't very good at yin and yang thinking. They, they want to like bifurcate things. So it's like, are you good or are you bad? Period, right? And then the yin and yang is like, we're both and they live in harmony, right? <laughs> but that's not like a Western context, but like your brain is categorizing things at all times just to facilitate decision-making and it does it automatically all by itself. That's how we get this in-group, out-group division, right? Which is again, a bifurcating division that's not necessarily accurate. And so I think, I love that the, the topic of the cooperation of the species, like on the forest floor, like, you know, they have the, the mushrooms and the tree roots are collaborating, you know, to swap nutrients oh, right. and its own form of altruism, you know, and so, those are ecological phenomena in the context that those species need to survive. And we can see ourselves as this interconnected, you know, biophilic organism that um, will help us, I think, in the long run. And I think that was kind of related to um, what Jennifer was asking. I want to make sure we can, um, Benjamin can make sure we cover Jennifer's, but I want to make sure to say what the urge is. The urge is like this pull, this like motivational force that makes you want to intervene, that makes you want to help, that kind of drives you in a literal way toward somebody in need, um, even if, because it's altruism, even if it's going to cost you something in the short term to do so. And it doesn't require a lot of complex cognition and just deliberative decision making. So the book is about times where you might feel what almost seems to be an irrational drive to help an individual, um, but like it makes sense from a genetic and biological and evolutionary perspective why you would do that. And um, just for the audience, we were just defining, someone asked to define urge um, and, and what sort of goes into that. And then I did, you're right, because I'm glad the Jennifer question came in, because that was something I was also kind of thinking of. We have the, the sort of assumption that we are self-interested, and then Jennifer Nixon in the audience is asking about gendered issues of empathy and altruism. I think there's another assumption that, like, altruism is a gendered thing that occurs, you know, differently yeah. among men and women, so I was wondering if that's something you could also speak to a bit. Yeah, that's a great question from Jennifer. And it comes up quite a lot, actually, in empathy research, where there's a lot of research that kind of can lean in either direction. So I think we're best off going with the nature, nurture, not mutually exclusive, you know, like heuristic, where because empathy and altruism derive from a caregiving need, the need to care for offspring and so many mammals, at least social living, um, you know, long group living animals um, provide care from the female primarily with sometimes the male involved and sometimes not. 
that's not true across animals in general or across evolution, but it's true in this case of these caregiving mammals. There is a biological reason to assume that females have some upregulated um, capacity for this attention and um, behavior. But I don't think that's exclusive of saying males are not empathic. Again, you don't wanna either or, you want to like get the nuance, right? Like males are surely participating in altruism all the time and they're empathic with other people, you know, frequently. But um, in our, there was a recent meta-analysis, which means they looked across, you know, dozens or hundreds of studies to compare the results of them. And they conclude that there is some non-cultural um, basis that's sort of, you know, baked into the biology. But for sure, women are also socialized to be altruistic and empathic at a cost to themselves, honestly, you know, like, the woman has to be soft and warm and caring. And if she asks for a raise, she's looked at as, you know, inappropriate, whereas like a man doing it is thought of as perfectly normal. So I think um, we are socialized and it's important to think about the ways in which it harms women to only be considered as, you know, like soft and warm and fuzzy <laughs> and to only be appreciated in that regard, you know. I think of Hillary Clinton as kind of suffering from this, this conflict between our concept of like a woman and a mother and a wife versus our concept of a politician as like a male and a strong, right. you know, powerful person. And they're sometimes like misaligned, at least in America. A lot of other countries have female leaders, prime ministers, you know, and queens and they're they don't have any problem with that but i think in america we have like maybe even a stronger um cultural bias that way maybe because of like the role of religion in our lives i'm not sure that i haven't studied <laughs> but that's that's my educated guess so we've uh, run out of questions in the Q and A. So if I may, um, at the beginning of the uh, uh, sort of before the talk started, you're both talking about the ways that fiction yeah. has been part of your um, part of your education as well as part of the your, things you've done with your your classrooms. And I was wondering if we could, since we're doing a bookstore talk, talk a little bit about what fiction has meant for both of you in terms of teaching and discussing science. Sure. Yeah. I think that's an awesome question. Garrett has um, a really interesting story from his teaching. For me, I am just kind of like a compulsive reader. I really enjoy consuming fiction, especially. Um, and I learn a lot from it. And I think in these past few years, a lot of people have learned about the perspective of, you know, people of color through this proliferation of art and literature that is made more accessible in the past few years. I think it has really benefited us. And um, I also think like your primary experience, like if I work, you know, when I worked at a primate center, a non-human primate center, because we're primates <laughs> also, um, you just observe, you're like, well, that monkey's like that and that monkey's like that. And it's like as plain as, you know, the nose on your face, and there's a perfect an analogous overlap to the way, you know, we are in a society or in high school or, you know, with the bullies on the block, you know, it's those primary experiences are very powerful in the way you think of other animals, I think. Garrett has a, a really interesting um, use of fiction. Yeah, I, I so I took, um, starting in like 2004, I went to a writing program through the University of Iowa. They have a ter terrific writing Writers program every workshop. summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't do the workshop. I did the summer writing <laughs> festival. But over the years, I took multiple classes. And in one of these, one of the dinners after the classes were done, one of the faculty got up and said, you know, fiction is truer than nonfiction. And mm -hmm. I thought that's a bunch of junk. That's just not true. And over the years, I have come to believe that that I was wrong. There's so much truth in fiction. And I think it's because as the person pointed out that night, through fiction, you can get at truths that you can't quite get to if everything's so tightly 
like as scientists, we have to be so careful about the particulars that sometimes we miss the point, the bigger point, which is one of the great things that I think Stephanie's been doing over the years is trying to get at the bigger point and making that point. What's 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 really going on here? But I feel like, um, and, and the way that touched me personally is that I started to look at my the animals I was working with from a more uh, narrative way. And I started to recognize my own subjectivity as I was working on them. And I started to see things in them that first made my science better, eventually made it so that I decided that I would not work with animals. Lastly, I want to say is I taught, I thought this was so valuable in making myself a better scientist that I started to teach it to graduate students and they flourished. They loved this class. Um, most of my teaching, they was fine. <laughs> I wasn't a terrible teacher. I was just an okay teacher or maybe a good one. But with this class, they were on fire. They were just, and, and I taught them about voice and syntax and, and metaphor. And they started to come alive. And I think, and it was my motivation too, it's because in science, we are taught to be objective, which means get the me out of the picture. I'm just an observer. I'm like a widget. I'm actually kind of like I see the mice or the animals we work with. We're almost like little robots. So when you give a science student the opportunity to actually say I exist in, at all and these are the experiences I have, it's like, it's like this massive door opens up. So I think that that, I feel like that should be somehow incorporated in, in courses throughout the United States so that if anything, it just gives scientists the capacity to be themselves to be subjective human beings and, and work with the subjective creatures that they are in charge of. <laughs> and, and books also give us access to science we can't ourselves get too deeply involved in. Like maybe you recently read The Overstory or Lab yeah, Girl, yeah, yeah. and this yeah, is related yeah. to what David was saying maybe. Like I learned so much from those books and they were, you know, sort of entertainment, but also highly educational um, at the same time. And so like my understanding of trees is completely different now than it was yeah, right. you know, two right. years ago. Right, yeah. Oh, that book is terrific. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a, <laughs> yeah. I gotta yeah. reread that one. And uh, you know, everyone knew who Suzanne Samard was after reading the overstory and it, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's really wonderful how we've sort of been talking about fiction and also it's all been also discussing the content of the book and altruism and perspective and seeing things from you know people's point of view um so we are almost at a, at time i just wanted to turn things over to the two of you one last time just for any closing remarks or words for our audience this has been tremendous well i'm just so grateful to have this opportunity i'm, I'm so grateful for benjamin and the co-owners of the store for inviting me and allowing me to talk about something obviously I'm like passionate about and I think everyone should know about, you know, but like <laughs> if you just talk to yourself or random people at the grocery store, you don't get very far. And so I, I'm so grateful yeah. to have these other people attending or watching online later and from the bookstore for facilitating that and for facilitating the ability for books to like reach more people. I think it's just awesome. And I'm, I'm grateful for the same reasons. It's also, I'm just grateful because I'm with, I'm talking with Stephanie actually of, with other people listening, but you know, I mean, you've been a, you've been an icon in, in, in my work, um, a role model and to be able to uh, actually just have a conversation with you. It's, you know, it's like a child having a conversation with Santa Claus or something. I mean, it's just a great deal, right? So wow, that, that seems over the top, but I'll, I'll take it because the compliments are few and far between in academia if you're not <laughs> yeah, from you don't that get field. Them. <laughs> so you got to soak them up when you can. <laughs> yeah, right. Tomorrow you go back to your day job. <laughs> right, right. Rejections. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you once again um, for this fantastic presentation. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Um, please learn more about this book and purchase The Altruistic Urge at harvard.com. I put the link to our website in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your day. Keep reading and be well. Thank you both again for joining us. This has so been much. wonderful. Thanks Thank so much. So Have much. a great day. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.